Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. Today I just wanted to offer a few reflections on what I would call the pathology of apathy. The problem with some things like apathy is they become so common that people begin to think they're part of the word normal, and they're absolutely not. Uh, pathology is something that specifically leads to a broken or diseased condition, something that is destructive, um, something that is a, a really unhealthy way to be. If we were to regard apathy as a pathology, we would be responding to it with as much uh, enthusiasm, I suppose, as we might respond to a measles epidemic. You know, that if we have vaccines, great. If we don't, there's a lot of other things we can do. Vac vaccines are not the only way to fight any particular pathology. It seems in every case, though, what, they, what both or all the methods have in common is bringing awareness to the challenge, that the first thing to do in fighting an epidemic is to become aware that it's there. And then at that point to become aware of what supports the epidemic and what works against it. And to begin to really support and nurture and expand those things that work against it. If we could look at apathy for a moment as an epidemic, as a pathology, as something that needs to be battled to figure out what it is that supports apathy and to begin to undermine those things and to look at what it is that prevents apathy, uh, the sorts of interpersonal dynamics and ways of living and ways of making choices that keep us involved and keep us appropriately concerned about the circumstances and events of our lives. I mean, as the old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. If we can find ways to prevent apathy from ever occurring, we would never have to deal with eradicating it. Unfortunately, at the moment, there's plenty of it to go around, but it's not being regarded as the dangerous epidemic that it is, as the dangerous pathology that it is. When there is apathy, the motivation and inspiration that drives human ingenuity and creativity withers and fades and goes away and things stagnate and after a while you hear people saying well this is the way it's always been as if they have resigned themselves to a particular set of oppressive circumstances uh, or to particular dynamics that ultimately are really not serving anyone very well they're just simply the way everyone's always done it because we haven't invited our ingenuity to take us beyond that the close corollary of apathy is narcissism, which I regard narcissism as the negation of all relationship. That when someone is truly narcissistic, they don't even have a relationship with themselves. It is when in the original Greek story from which the term is derived, Narcissus is a very handsome young man who sees his reflection in a pool and is so transfixed by it that he stares at it literally until he dies. It is not the real self that he's looking at. It is simply a reflection, one very, very thin reflection. When, so when people say, oh, he's just full of himself, I usually counter, well, actually he's not. He may be like Narcissus staring at the reflection, but there is no substance of the person within the reflection. It's just an image. When we look at someone and see only an image and we don't see the real person, we don't see the substance and the depth the ability, the creativity, the ingenuity, the, the strength of the person, we're missing out on all the best parts. Apathy in that sense robs us of the best parts of each other and of the best parts of ourselves. People can even be apathetic about their own growth and development. You know, I've, I've worked at something so long, I'm just tired, I don't want to work anymore. Well, when they become that apathetic about it, essentially they cease to live. They're no longer 
infusing themselves with love and inspiration and energy. They're not getting up and dancing out their joy so that everybody can see it. They're not getting up and and walking the path that they believe should be walked with purposefulness, with a an understanding of toward what it is that they are journeying. In going through the whole public educational system, I was required to show up every day as a student, so I would show up. But there were classes to which I found I had to resign myself because they were required. Uh, it was profoundly disappointing to me in some cases to even hear the teachers themselves speak of their subject area as boring and tedious and not inspiring because, of course, I didn't really have an opinion one way or the other until they told me that, oh, by the way, this is a boring subject. It's like, oh, is it? Okay, I'll try to relate to it as a boring subject, which is obviously not helpful because there was so much more I could have learned if I would have known how to utilize the opportunity of this teacher and that classroom and these resources. All of that, however, disallows and displaces completely any kind of apathy. You cannot be apathetic and make something beautiful. You cannot be apathetic and learn to love someone and, or learn to love an activity or have a passion for uh, a sport or an artistic activity or a professional activity or any any particular section of the library. Uh, there are people who have a passion for books. They want to read all sorts of things and read and read and read. That's their passion. And they learn a lot as they do it. At some point, though, I would say that they need to move beyond just reading into applying what they've read. Uh, unless they are perhaps engaged in taking what they have read and distributing it through some other means. Uh, I'm reminded of one of my favorite characters on a television show that was on quite a number of years ago called Northern Exposure was the radio announcer named Chris who would regularly quote from literature and philosophy and all sorts of things that no one had ever read. But he'd quote it over the radio so that the whole town was benefiting from his passion for reading and for thinking deeply about all sorts of issues of life and, and living. In high school, I was exposed to the book uh, Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And one of the phrases from that book that stuck in my mind most uh, acutely most sharply was that there are people who come, that he didn't want to come to the point of death, that he didn't want to come to the point of death and realize that he had never really lived. So he took this time of uh, kind of a personal retreat of sorts, an extended retreat where he went to Walden Pond, uh, this particular location, and did this all this writing and journaling, thinking about life in its basic forms and how the basic forms were revealing every moment they were there the most profound insights, but everyone in racing through the motions of life was totally missing it and not noticing what life itself was attempting to teach. It's a very profound sort of work, but one that shouldn't be read quickly because there's so many things there to think about and try to digest more deeply. Even, even the simple descriptions, like how many chairs to have in the house, it was specifically because of the way he understood relationships that he made the statements about that that he did. One, at one point he talks about the path between uh, the house and the pond and noticed that after a short, relatively short period of time, it had become fairly worn and commented on how that seems to be a metaphor for the way people's routines can sometimes fall into worn paths to where they don't venture anywhere else and there was so much more of the woods around to explore. The interesting thing around that whole um, experiment of, of taking some time out at uh, Walden Pond was that Henry David Thoreau was essentially a student who wanted to embark on self-directed study. The location of Walden Pond was on property owned by Ralph Waldo Emerson who another very famous literary uh, writer who uh, I believe at that time was a college professor and that's how the two of them met and he provided the space within which uh, Henry David Thoreau could do that, uh, could write that book and have that experiment and learn about life. 
in the same sort of way. I mean, the one thing that that relationship, informal and and perhaps distant though it may have been, it, I don't know whether the two of them were especially close friends or anything, but on, on the surface it sounds like he was simply a teacher who heard that a student wanted to do something unusual. And he said, well, there's a pond out on my property. You're welcome to go stay in the little cabin there and, and at the pond and we'll be over the hill up in the main house or something. I'm not sure exactly how far away Emerson's house was from the cabin at Walden Pond, but he was not apathetic. He was specifically supportive of life unfolding and blossoming and telling about itself through this experiential experiment that Henry David Thoreau did. There was no apathy. It was total opposite of that. And in, in being willing to do this, obviously Thoreau didn't have any apathy either. He was involved in the living of life. In that sense, apathy could actually be considered something that sucks the spiritual and energetic and emotional and psychological life out of people. That we don't become anywhere near who and what we could be Specifically, because, specifically by learning not to care about either our involvement or the outcome. Uh, or more especially, to not care about, yes, but what does it mean? Not just what happened, not just how did it look, not just how did it feel, but what did it mean? In the bigger picture of things, what understanding could throw right that he could leave to future generations that we are reading so many, many, many years later, and that is still inspiring people. And I imagine inspired quite a few people in his own time as well. But perhaps, like most authors and artists, the, the effect of artistic and literary works grows slowly enough that frequently they are gone by the time people realize what a treasure uh, that they were. And so we have the more limited treasure of what work did they leave behind. Well, with that in mind, myself as a writer and doing these shows and so forth, I do my best to make sure that I leave records of my work behind, You know, which is why copies of, of every show I've done have wound up in the Western History Department of the Denver Public Library. This is not about apathy. This is about combating the pathology of apathy. This is about, well, in, in some of the ethnic or, or tribal sorts of societal norms and directives. This is about the elders teaching their wisdom to the younger generations so that the younger generations can be wise elders when the time comes. It's about combating the generation gap. It's about not being apathetic that someone has died. I recall reading somewhere that when an old person dies, it's like a library burning down. That there, is, that there are insights and knowledge and wisdom and ways of looking at life that that person knew that are suddenly no longer available. It's not that they should be put on a pedestal or that the children should be put on a pedestal. It's that all of them need to be engaged in dialogue. That the elders need to know what the youth are discovering and the youth need to know what has already been discovered so that they know even more new places to look. There's a sense in which each builds on the other and yet there's also frequent times where the new replaces the old. When a particular piece of clothing wears out, it gets to a point where there's nothing left to patch. It's rags upon rags upon rags and there's nothing left to patch too. And so at some point the old has to be let go and the new has to be instituted. Even in tribal societies, that at some point the elders would be gone and other people would have to take their place. There was no way to keep the elders alive infinitely. Their bodies weren't designed to do that. Apathy simply says there's always tomorrow and allows for, there's always tomorrow in the sense of procrastination, not in the sense of opportunity. Discovery and adventure would say there's always tomorrow, but it may not be me who does it tomorrow. I may have to leave the, I may have to build the beginning of a work and then leave it for someone else to finish. And, and that too is fine as long as we're aware of that and as we do an effective job of transitioning that. So it's not apathy about growing older. 
It's about maintaining abilities and teaching that wisdom, passing along as much as you can to the next generation, and encouraging them to take what you give them and expand upon it, not to be limited by it. That what, you're, that what the elders give to the youth is to be a launching pad, not a, a, a domed restriction, not a, a cage, not a limitation, but specifically a launching pad to fuel the next generation's rockets into outer space. The pathology of apathy, though, stands in opposition to all of this and would leave us with nothing more than what happens purely by accident, allowing no opportunity for progress resulting from human struggle. You know, Frederick, Drug Frederick Douglass said, there is no progress without struggle. Y using the metaphor of birth, there is no birth that does not involve a birth struggle of some sort. We we can give women drugs and medications and all sorts of things to reduce their awareness of the struggle, but we cannot prevent the struggle from happening, nor should we, because to prevent the struggle would be to prevent the birth. Those who are not willing to struggle, those who are not willing to forsake their apathy and engage in the struggle and wrestle with the question no matter how long it takes, will never know the new life that can be born out of that struggle. Even in, you going back to the metaphor of birth, during the struggle of giving birth, neither the woman nor the baby know whether the baby will survive. And for that matter, in many pastimes, it was not always certain whether the mother would survive. There were a great many women in the past who died in childbirth because of a whole variety of possible reasons. But the point within this conversation is simply that it is a a risky, intense engagement for the continuance of life that is essential, but that even that, no matter, in spite of the fact that it's essential, still doesn't provide any guarantees. We have to take what we're given and do the best we can with it. But when the time comes, whether it's unexpected and premature, like a young woman dying in childbirth, or whether it's uh, after many, many years, like the elderly grandmother finally letting go when there's simply no more ability to be here, to, in both those cases, to understand that life doesn't come with guarantees, but it's a collection of opportunities to which apathy would make us blind. All the more reason why we need to oppose apathy as if it were some very dangerous pathology, because in fact it is. Because it's so common, though, and because it takes less work, it's often overlooked and brushed aside like, okay, fine, everyone's apathetic. It's like, no, oh my God, everyone's apathetic. This is an emergency. This is a very dangerous situation. It needs our attention. We need to move beyond it if we are to genuinely survive in more than just a physical form. You can stagnate and keep the body alive for a very long time. There are machines in hospitals that can force the body to continue breathing and the heart to keep beating and so forth. It's not a really alive person, though, because there's no... The engagement with the growth and the insights and the development, the engagement with relationship, with passing wisdom to the next generation, the engagement of supporting the exploration and development of the youthful generation, that as they are finding new ways that have never been tried before to experience music, to experience food, to experience engineering and technology and the wilderness and all sorts of things, that sort of engagement is what makes us genuinely alive. Apathy makes us, inwardly at least, genuinely dead. One person I, whom I had a similar discussion with sometime in the past compared it to what's called dieseling in an automobile. That in some, sometimes in an older automobile there will be fuel deposits and things that collect in the engine and kind of gum it up in a weird sort of way. And when the person goes to shut off the car, they turn the key back and the car should stop but all of this residual fuel deposits and whatnot on the engine 
uh, catches a little spark and keeps exploding. And so it's like the car keeps running for a couple minutes longer, kind of coughing and sputtering and, and running a little bit more. And finally, after this fuel inside the cylinders is burned up, finally the car quits because the carburetor isn't feeding it any more fuel. In a similar sort of way, apathy may allow for the dieseling of a human body, for a, a person to keep moving through the motions and pretending that something is really going on. But it's there's no true life there. Applying this to the level of religious institutions, there are churches that have enormous amounts of activity, kind of like a car dieseling, but there is no genuine life. There's no spiritual growth happening. The car is not actually moving anywhere. It's simply sitting in place and every Sunday we go through the same sorts of motions and we sing the songs and we say the words and then we go home and we are completely unchanged by the experience. We haven't moved anywhere. We're just exactly where we were before we even walked into the building. For me, this, ap this opposition to apathy even bridges over to theatrical performance in that in the Broadway theater district in New York City, there are plays and musicals that frequently run for years doing the same play over and over and over again every single night, sometimes multiple times. And the challenge for every actor and actress is to give the performance with all the vivacity, all the, all the enthusiasm, all the energy, as if it were the very first time. And perhaps for people in the audience, it is the very first time. But for the actors and actresses, it's, it's got to be more than just mouthing the words. If they mouth the words, if they, have, if they have become apathetic about their role and they're not putting energy and life into it, even the best written script, the audience suddenly finds themselves becoming bored because there's not an engagement. Apathy robs us of that engagement, that connection, that inspiration that has us walking out of the theater going, wow, that was incredible. I went to see a Broadway play once, or a Broadway musical, when I was a student at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City, and it was this brilliant, widely regarded musical, and I found halfway through I was positively bored because there was no involvement with the deeper meanings or the emotions of the, of the story. It was simply an excess of dancing and costumes and music and glittery everything, but it didn't mean anything. And I found myself getting absolutely bored with it. I went into the theater to see a show. I walked out of the theater the same person I went in. I was not, there was no development, there was no growth, there was no it was an invitation to be apathetic about it because clearly, in, in my opinion, clearly the actors and actresses were going through the motions, saying the lines, doing it more or less with precision and correctness, but they weren't infusing life into the audience. They weren't inspiring people to go out and be wiser and more loving and build a better world than, than what you've known. According to one um, school of thought, I guess you'd say, the whole world of theater actually began with religious ceremonies in ancient Greece. In that sense, the actors and the actresses were very much the equivalent of ministers and priests and, and holy people playing out stories and insights about deities, about divine mystery, about the divine mysteries of life. In a sense, that same sort of ministerial play acting continues to this day in every occupation across the country. Whatever person you come, no matter with whom you come into contact in any occupation, there is a sense in which every moment of life has the opportunity to be both a ministry and a lesson. And in every moment, there's a ministry to perform and a lesson to learn. It's similar to when I've spoken with various teachers over the years who describe themselves as learning from their students, that it is not about showing up and presenting information and indoctrinating the students. It is about the teachers and the students joining in collaboration 
uh, a collaboration that would be impossible if there were any significant amount of apathy in the room. The apathy, w apathy would be demonstrated by the students who file in, sit down at their desk, turn their assignments in, and really couldn't care less about anything that's being said, about the material they're addressing, about what's being presented, about the teacher. And there are teachers, unfortunately, perhaps because they've just gotten burned out on doing it over and over, who go into a classroom and present the material and never really know their students. They become apathetic about the learning process and they're going through the motions of the job. Whether you're a minister or a teacher or a fireman or a policeman or a farmer or a rancher or whatever, being fully present and being fully engaged and noticing that the people to whom you're communicating are real multidimensional people, that they come from various emotional states and places, from various stories and past experiences, and we gather together in whatever particular space or room or classroom. I mean, sometimes a classroom is out in the wilderness. It's not necessarily within a building. And within that room, we join together as a team indirectly to combat apathy, more directly to empower life. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that some of the comments of the last half hour have been helpful to you. Blessings.